Our main man, Mr. Threlkeld, kicks things off with a bombshell about the paternity of his 18-month-old mini-me, Liliana, thanks to a plot twist courtesy of his wife's not-so-secret rendezvous while he was playing hero overseas. Now, he's calling in the science squad for a paternity test to see if he's really the daddy. Hold on to your hats. This soap opera is just getting started. Mr. Threlkeld, you have entered this courtroom with a marriage on the brink of divorce. You state that while you were out of the country serving in the military, your wife raided around town with other men and she has admitted cheating multiple times you claim you are not sure if you are the father of her third child 18 month old liliana and have asked the court for a paternity test yes, are you sitting down because mr threlkeld's tale of woe and intrigue is like a telenovela on steroids picture this he's out there defending his country only to uncover his wife's escapades back home as if that's not enough drama for one day a surprise attack cuts him off from the world leaving him to stew in a crock pot of betrayal and worry and folks Folks, believe me when I say this emotional roller coaster has more loops than a theme park. Don't touch that dial. Earlier on in the day, me and him got into some words, so I thought we were gonna, you know, settle it. Well, it turns out his wife and my wife were friends, and she had found out that she was actually stripping as we spoke. At the time, you know, I found out about it. I thought, you know, it was all just a hoax. So I went, you know, calmly to the uh, internet lounge, got on Facebook, and asked her, hey, you know, is, is it true you're doing what I told you I didn't want you doing at all? Right after I left there, our base actually got attacked. Just when you think you've got a handle on the feels, Mr. Threlkeld hits you with the gut punch of loneliness. Imagine coming home from serving your country, dreaming of hugs and warm welcomes, only to be greeted by the sound of crickets. It's like a country song gone wrong, highlighting just how rocky the road has been in the Threlkeld household. But wait, the saga marches on. That's one whole outfit? That's a, I think it's a dress is what they call it. I don't know. Yeah. Clear shoes with money still in them. <laughs> and okay, the that was for decoration. So you come home, Mr. Threlkeld, and your, your wife and your family aren't there. But she eventually does pick you up. So you were there at yes, some point to get it. And just when you think things can't get any more Jerry Springer, we take another twisty turn. Mr. Threlkeld, in a move that's equal parts desperate and bewildering, reveals the master plan behind baby number two, an attempt to curtain call his wife's career on the pole. Spoiler alert, things get messier. Strap in. The revelations are about to hit harder than a daytime soap cliffhanger. You come back and you have in your mind, maybe if I could get her to stop stripping, we could maybe make it work. I yes. get her pregnant. She can stay off the pole and stay in the house. Think about all the other expenses of having a child. Bottom line, Your Honor, is I had to support my children. There are things you need to do. And I knew he wasn't going to get a job when huh. he came back. Within three weeks of us being home, she was pregnant. So, I mean, I don't know if it was my devious, messed up. The drama thickens like a plot stew as Ms. Threlkeld steps into the spotlight with a truth bomb that's got a 50% chance of blowing your mind. Mr. Threlkeld might or might not be the father of Liliana. It's like Maury Povich meets high-stakes poker, folks. And trust me, you'll want to stick around for the next hand. That he is the father of Liliana. It could be a 50-50 chance, honestly. Your Anybody honor. got a quarter? Do you understand that for a man, for any person, that, that would be really hard to accept. There is a part of me that listens to you both talk and see one, if not both of you, maybe still wants to make this work. Interested and in trying to see if you could save this marriage? Yes, Your Honor. Hold your breath, folks, because we're on the edge of our seats, waiting for the grand reveal. The DNA results are in. In the case of Threlkeld versus Threlkeld, pertaining to one-year-old Liliana, Mr. Threlkeld, you are Liliana's father. <laughs> Ms. Threlkeld, it seems like you became instantly emotional. Is that relief or is that yes, Your Honor, it's joy? Really, or I both? mean, it's all together. I'm happy because I know she's his, so I would like to work on everything. Oh, man, Hold on to your hats, folks, because you're about to dive into the bewildering saga of Livingston Verge, Livingston, and Duerschlag. Ms. Livingston steps into the legal arena, demanding a DNA showdown to convince her bewildered ex, Mr. Livingston, that he's not the daddy of her 21 month old munchkin, Jordan. Meanwhile, Mr. Livingston convinced that his ex is trying to cut him out of the picture to reckon La Flames with her old flame, Mr. Doerschlag. Ms. Livingston, you've petitioned this court for a DNA test on your 21-month-old daughter, Jordan, to prove to your now ex-husband, Mr. Livingston, that he is not Jordan's biological father. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. You claim that the only reason your ex-wife is denying you are the father is because she desperately wants to have a relationship with her ex-boyfriend. In a jaw-dropping twist that no one, absolutely no one, saw coming, Ms. Livingston spills the beans on why she's convinced Mr. Livingston isn't the father. Apparently, she was juggling dates with both gents around baby-making season, but bets on Mr. Doerschlag being the bio-dad. Why? Little Jordan's sprouting blonde locks.
locks, a genetic curveball neither of the supposed papas could have pitched. Grab your popcorn, the drama's just getting started. Around the time of concession, I had sex with another man. You did? Yes, Your Honor. But did you also have sex with Mr. Livings? Yes, Your Honor. So why is it you believe that the other man is your child's father and not Mr. Livingston? My daughter, when she was born, she looked a lot like Mr. Livingston. She had dark hair and, you know, she had some of his facial features, but as she got older, she got blonde hair. Neither Mr. Livingston nor I have blonde hair, but Mr. Dorschlag does. She started to look a lot like Mr. Dorschlag. Just when you think it couldn't possibly get any juicier, Mr. Livingston stands his ground, insisting he's Jordan's true papa bear, armed with an arsenal of prenatal appointment receipts and heartwarming birth memories. His tale of daddy-daughter bonding is Oscar-worthy. Meanwhile, Ms. Livingston reminisces about dropping the pregnancy bomb on him, painting a picture of a man emotionally and practically all in. But wait, there's a plot twist on the horizon. And so, Mr. Livingston, you, are you on the baby's birth certificate? Yes, Your Honor. You are? I've been told I was the baby's father from the, the very first day that we found out she was pregnant. And you were with her throughout the pregnancy? Yes, Your Honor. Went to the doctor's appointment? Yes, Your Honor. And you were there when the baby was born? Yes, Your Honor. So I, I had her C section. I let her mother go in the delivery room while she was doing the C section. But you were there waiting? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. The saga thickens with the echoes of divorce papers flapping in the wind. Post divorce, Ms. Livingston drops another bombshell. Mr. Doerschlag might be on the baby daddy leaderboard. The plot thickens. The divorce was Ms. Livingston's escape route after discovering Mr. Livingston's digital dalliances with a relative. And just when you think you've seen it all, the story Story takes another wild turn. And I hear a knock on the door. It's a cop. He's coming to bring me the divorce papers. And then when he leaves shortly after that, I get a phone call from my ex-wife over here. There is a possibility that Jordan is not mine. So you called him and said that, Miss Livingston? Your Honor, I told him yes, there was a possibility that Jordan was not his. The reason I filed for the divorce is not so that I could be with Mr. Dorschlag. It's because I got a screenshot of a text message from my family member saying that he had asked for nude photos. As the drama escalates, Ms. Livingston confesses to keeping the flames of past passion with Mr. Doerschlag alive, tangled in a web of love, longing, and daddy dilemmas. The suspense is unbearable. What will happen next? I said, there is one person in my life that will always be in my heart, and that is Jace Dorschlag. And there is there nothing you, go, you can do Honor. to change it. She just proved her point. And so you think this is all about her trying to get back with Mr. Dorschlag? Yes, Your Honor. You don't have any doubt that this child is your biological no, your, child? No, Your Honor cranking up the intensity. Witness testimony from Mr. Livingston's sister throws a family resemblance Hail Mary into the mix, challenging Ms. Livingston's quest for a Dowerschlag dynasty. The courtroom is buzzing with anticipation. What's coming next? You won't want to miss it. Time, but as she's gotten older and her hair is light and she does have some features of Jason. Every child is born with every DNA color in their body. Her hair can be any color it wants, no matter the parent. It looks just like Michael. Why do you think that Ms. Livingston is saying unequivocally, Mr. Livingston is not my child's father? I I think because she adamantly wants a relationship with Mr. Dorschlag and she wants nothing to do with my brother and she doesn't want him to be around. And then the grand finale, leaving audiences everywhere gasping. The DNA results are in. It has been determined by this court. Her biological father is Mr. Livingston. Know for sure. I just wanted to know for sure. And I told Mr. Doris, like, I didn't know for sure. Ms. McCrary, armed with a hefty stack of documents, charging towards the courtroom to demand a DNA test. She's adamant Mr. Goodson is the dad of her adorable, yet very demanding, 18-month-old mini-me. She's all, he hasn't lifted a finger. Mr. Goodson, on the other hand, is in full denial mode, swearing up and down that there's no way he's the father. And just when you think it's all been said, bam, the next part hits you. Ms. McCrary, you have petitioned the court for a DNA test to prove that the defendant is the father of your miracle baby, 18 month old Arian McCrary. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Goodson, you say the plaintiff has brought the wrong man to court and you refuse to do anything for a child. And then things crank up to 11. Ms. McCrary, not one to back down, launches into a passionate tirade about Mr. Goodson's refusal to acknowledge his daughter. She calls her little one a miracle baby, possibly due to surviving on a diet of soap operas and pure determination, and paints a vivid picture of her life as a solo warrior mom. Brace yourselves. It's about to get even more emotionally charged. You wouldn't think that you'll be having a baby. I'm like, okay, here she go. And I just take one day at a time. I don't know what else. Has he been involved in her life at all? 17 months. He has been to a certain extent, okay? I can count on one hand how many times. One he, hand in 17 months, I, you can yes, count? Yes, Your Honor, and counting. 
okay? And when you see her. That's my miracle baby, you know? I, I didn't know I could, you know, conceive. You know, when you're in a relationship, you know, you have an unprotected sex. Your jaw will drop, and you might need to sit down for this. In a twist worthy of a telenovela, Ms. McCrary drops the bombshell about their secret rendezvous. While Mr. Goodson was on a break from his wife, this juicy bit of gossip adds layers of complexity to their already tangled web of a story. And believe it or not, there's still more drama to unfold. Being intimate, he still had this other family and this other life? Oh, okay. Yes, Your Honor. <laughs> oh. Oh, okay. That's important testimony. <laughs> when you said you were going to reach out to her to let her know you wanted to make things a little more serious, how serious could it get when you already <laughs> had another person? She was like, no, nah, I don't... I, that's not what I want right now. Dude. Because even though you were separated, you were still technically married. And I always and say, I a man is married until he is divorced. Here's where the plot goes, from thick to downright viscous. Ms. McCrary, with the flair of a seasoned novelist, recounts the steamy night of passion she's convinced led to their daughter's conception. It's a story so detailed, you can almost hear the sultry saxophone playing playing in the background. Prepare your heartstrings for some serious tugging in the next bit. What is the day you can see? He picked me up that night from work, July the 10th, okay? If I'm not mistaken, we got American Deli, okay? He likes to eat. I like to eat. Not a problem. Extra chicken, extra cheese, sub sandwich. Yeah, okay. Up and up. So, like with that. that being said, you know, you, when, when you're grown, you're nasty, you get in tune. I like the things he do to me, vice versa. You know, we enjoy each other. Why not? We're grown. You know, we hadn't had protected sex, so come on. You know, at the end of the day, when it's all set, and done that and how was it? <laughs> Get ready for an emotional roller coaster. Ms. McCrary reminisces about the day she broke the pregnancy news to Mr. Goodson. His reaction? A plot twist of supportive hugs and dreams of daddyhood, which, spoiler alert, quickly turned into a battlefield of broken promises. But wait, there's more to this saga. Well, of course, I told family members, you know, they, they were up for my decision, and I had to just sit and, you know, think about it. You know, I gave him a call. You came right away. So when I told him, he was just up for it. I'll be there. I'll rub your stomach, take you to doctor's appointment, and I just felt like, oh, okay, well, you know, maybe he hurt for me. Maybe he's gonna be hurt for me. It was not all okay. You know, I didn't want to be by myself. You'll never see this curveball coming. Mr. Goodson, in a moment of vulnerability, shares his backstory of a previous paternity misfire, explaining his current trust issues. It's a confession that adds depth to his character and makes you rethink everything. And just when you think you can predict the ending, the climax is upon us. I went down to the hospital, I think, like the second day after she was born. And, you know, I seen her, you know, she was a beautiful baby. She was a beautiful little girl. And I know I know kids can, you know, they'll come out light and, and, and eventually they'll get darker and look like, I've been through this before. You've been through a paternity <clears throat> issue before. Yes, Your Honor. Was it determined that you were the father or you were not? I were not the father. I was you, not the father. You were not. After four years. It's not my fault the moment we've all been waiting for, and it's a doozy. The DNA results are in, and surprise, surprise. Determined by the court, Mr. Goodson, you are the father. Oh, okay. <laughs> you are the father. Okay, well, I want to apologize to you. Now that it's over with, you'll never have another problem out of me. In the bewildering maze of shock and awe, we leap into an entangled jungle of feelings, legal jargon, and dramatic pauses. Mrs. Watts steps up, armed with a PowerPoint and a dramatic flair, expressing her skepticism regarding the paternity of the defendant's 20-month-old son, Kazan, especially after her son, Alex's unfortunate demise in a bizarre gardening accident. This moment isn't just the opening act, it's the appetizer for a buffet of emotional and complex paternity disputes served with a side of intrigue. Grab your popcorn, because the soap opera is just getting started. Mrs. Watts, you are here on behalf of your deceased son, Alex, who was tragically murdered just a few months ago. Very sorry for your loss. You stand here on his behalf because you doubt he fathered the defendant's 20-month-old son, Caden, and you have asked for a DNA test to determine the truth. Yes, Your Honor. You say that you are 100% sure that Ms. Watt's son, Alex, fathered your baby, Caden. As the story gets thicker than a plot of cold oatmeal, we're introduced to a new, bold perspective. Ms. Cheryl, with the confidence of a reality TV star stands her ground, claiming Alex is indeed the superhero father of her child, Caden, flying in the face of Mrs. Watts's skepticism. This counterclaim not only stirs the pot, but also turns up the heat on the emotional cooker, setting the stage for an epic showdown of loss, love, and legal battles. Tensions rise, and so does our anticipation for the next dramatic revelation. My two sons went to visit a friend who had some type of altercation with some gentlemen prior to my sons coming to visit their home. When my two sons got there, they were ambushed and murdered. Um, oh, I'm so sorry. When I got to the scene, my older son, Louis, he was still at the scene. He died on the scene. He was covered with a sheet. 
In the dim light of past memories, the ghost of a love story begins to dance. We delve into the romantic saga between Ms. Cheryl and Alex, including their dreams of a future filled with picket fences and pet llamas, tragically cut short. This dive into their past illuminates the murky waters of the paternity claim, weaving a tapestry of love, loss, and what-ifs. Strap in as the narrative car takes a sharp left into unexpected territory. And so he did get to know his father, yes. the man you say is his biological father, before he passed away. Yes. And what was their relationship like? Their relationship was like a father and son bond relationship. They were like two peas in a pod. Alex loved Caden to death. Miss Sherelle, you submitted a video of Caden and Alex, which you say shows the nature of their relationship. Yes, Your Honor. And you submitted that to the court. Yes, Your Honor. Yeah, just like you know what I'm saying. <laughs> you mad at me now? Just as we thought we were sailing smooth waters, a hurricane of revelations hits us. The uncovering of a cryptic text message exchange throws a wrench into the works, casting shadows of doubt over Caden's paternity. This bombshell not only shakes Ms. Cheryl's confidence, but also flips the script, turning the paternity saga into a mystery thriller. The plot thickens, and so does our intrigue, as we dive deeper into the rabbit hole of truth. They didn't want to keep the whole pregnancy a secret. He not he did not want nobody to know about the pregnancy. Why is that? He Alex was a secretive person. He did not like people in his business. And at the same time, I didn't tell my family I was pregnant either, so we both decided to keep this a secret. He was a private person. As secrets start to spill like tea in a gossip circle, the canvas of the case is splattered with shades of doubt and hidden agendas. Ms. Cheryl's choice to leave the father's name blank on Caden's birth certificate and opting for an alias? Last name unravels a web of doubts and showcases the clandestine nature of her liaison with Alex. This development adds a new dimension to the drama, hinting at the intricate dance of personal battles being fought behind the scenes. Buckle up, because this roller coaster of revelations is about to do a loop-de-loop. -loop. In her testimony, she talked about the fact that you had a relationship, a very good relationship with Alan. Yeah, we always hung out and did stuff together. He never talked about no babies or nothing. It was always, it was like, it's, all this is new to me this year. For. Like, I, we've I never know even you. met face to face for him to be able to say, have a say so on this. Talk well, about no. what Alex said. He never said nothing about no baby. So, uh, when you all would have your father's son time, when you would talk, he never mentioned I have a baby on the way. No. Reaching the pinnacle of our emotional expedition, a verdict emerges, casting a spotlight that changes the entire landscape. The dramatic unfurling of DNA test results reveals that. It has been determined by this court. The percentage of relatedness between Ms. Lita Watts and Caden is 0.006%. You are not related. <laughs> Ms. Reeves strides into court, all guns blazing, ready to prove without a shadow of a doubt that Mr. Silva is the father of her seven-month-old son, Legend. Picture this. She's 110% sure, and Mr. Silva is there, just as adamant, shaking his head in denial. It's like watching a tennis match, but with paternity on the line. And just when you're catching your breath, Mr. Silva comes out with a zinger. You are here today to prove that the defendant, Mr. Silva, is the biological father of your seven-month-old son, Legend. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Silva, you were involved in a paternity case on Love and Hip Hop Atlanta in support of your sister who took a DNA test to prove paternity of her child. The audacity levels are off the charts here. Mr. Silva, with the confidence of a peacock, lays out his philosophy on fidelity. Apparently, it's a one-way street where men get the express lane. His take? Men can wander off the path, but women? Nope, they better stay put. The judge's eyebrows hit the roof and the audience is half amused, half outraged. It's like Mr. Silva missed the memo from the 21st century. But hold on to your hats because Mr. Silva is about to double down. Um, I grew up loving women loving sex. You I, grew up loving sex. To me, I always felt like it was okay for men to go out, have sex, cheat, come home to their family, and women can't go out, have sex, and, you know, come home, and especially with a baby, you know, trying to, trying to say that I'm his father. Because all he wanted to do was cheat on me. I've been nothing but faithful to him since I first met him. He and so you believe so. he's projecting his unfaithfulness. Just when we thought we'd seen it all, Mr. Silva decides it's time for a history lesson nobody asked for, claiming men are hardwired to conquer, and women should basically just deal with it. The audience can't decide if they're watching a court case or a comedy show, with laughter battling shock. The judge is all but popping popcorn at this point. Mr. Silva's justifications are spiraling into an alternate reality, and we're all just along for the ride. The judges come back. You'll want to sit down for this. Well, Your Honor, I, I feel and like, you know, like God created men to, to conquer, to overrule, and woman cannot, <laughs> woman cannot empower men. What are we on, Game of Thrones? You see what I did with it? 
first of all, you said God created men to conquer, to and what else? To rule and women to cannot, rule. cannot overpower. The courtroom suddenly feels like a therapist's office. The judge, now playing the role of wise sage, cuts through the circus to remind everyone there's a kid at the center of this hula baloo. It's a moment of clarity in a sea of chaos, highlighting the tangled web of relationships and the heavy weight of responsibility. The air is thick with aha moments and reconsidered life choices. But just when you think we're moving towards sanity, another curveball. That could give rise to some doubt. If you then change your password so he can't see what's going on on your phone, most men, that's gonna make him think she possibly is involved with somebody else. That doesn't make it right that he's doing the wrong thing either. But you have to understand that his extra affairs outside of your relationship do not necessarily have bearing on the eternity issue that we're dealing with now. Cue the dramatic music for this plot twist. Mr. Silva, in a rare moment of introspection, admits he was only there for the baby's grand entrance and not the backstage drama of the pregnancy. It's a confession wrapped in a riddle with him signing the birth certificate but still playing the maybe I am, maybe I'm not game. And just when you think it can't get more complicated, enter the mysterious messenger. During this pregnancy, Mr. Silva, are you accompanying Ms. Reeves to doctor's appointments? No. Are you involved? Are you basically just being standoffish because you don't think it's your child? Your Honor, I've written when, as soon as she told me, I I told her who was the father. So I did not believe I was the father and I was not with her during her pregnancy. I was only there to be supportive during the birth. So in that moment, despite your doubt, you said, I want to be there at the hospital when the baby Yes, and I'm born. throughout the whole time I'm telling her I want a DNA test. Things get spicy with a capital S here. Out of the blue, a woman slides into Ms. Reeves' DMs with the gossip bombshell that Mr. Silva has been spreading his bets on fatherhood like it's blackjack. This revelation throws a grenade into the already explosive trust issues, setting the stage for an epic showdown. The anticipation is through the roof for the grand finale. Like, well, I have proof right here. A girl, she messaged me basically saying that, you know, they was talking. He was Let me see that evidence. Jerome, will you hand that to me? Here you go. He was her boyfriend as well. He didn't know me. I'm just so you got a message out of the blue from another woman. And it says, he told me you were his ex and that you were pregnant, but you're a and didn't know who the dad was. Hold on to your hats, folks. The climax is here, and it's a doozy. The DNA test results roll in like the credits of a blockbuster movie. And surprise, surprise. When it comes to seven-month-old legend Silva, it has been determined by this court. Mr. Silva, you are the father. <laughs> You are the That's all I needed to know, Yon. Buckle up for a twist that'll have your jaw on the floor as we dive into the saga where Mr. Jordan alleges he was bamboozled into signing the birth certificate of a kiddo who might just not be his mini-me. He's all in for a DNA showdown to scrub his name clean. The drama curtain rises on what promises to be a legal telenovela with more twists than a pretzel factory. And trust us, you'll barely believe the shenanigans up next. Mr. Jordan, you claim the defendant tricked you into signing her daughter's birth certificate and being a daddy. But two years later, you were told that another man is her body biological father. You opened your case because you want DNA proof you are not the father so you can get your name removed from the birth certificate. Is that correct? Picture the scene. Utter bewilderment. Mr. Jordan recounts the tale of deceit spun by Ms. Heim, who had him convinced he was the proud papa of little Caitlin, only to later uncover a plot twist worthy of a soap opera that there's possibly another daddy in the narrative. He shares his tale of feeling exploited, given his eagerness to step up to the plate for Caitlin since her debut into the world. But fasten your seat belts because this roller coaster of a story is about to do a loop to loop. Mr. Jordan, you say Ms. Heim tricked you? Yes. Explain. She tricked me into thinking that I was I was the father. She tricked me into thinking that Caitlyn was my was my first daughter. She she tricked me into thinking that that the other guy had done got a paternity test on Caitlyn cuz she told me, "Oh, he already got one and you know what I'm saying? I, that's why I know it's just you." She tricked me into thinking that that family was something sacred. Just when you thought it couldn't thicken, the plot pulls a fast one with Ms. Heim coming clean about her love triangle antics, but standing her ground that Mr. Jordan is indeed Caitlyn's bio dad. She vents her spleen over the gossip mill churning, causing her and her mini-me undue stress. It's a heart-wrenching chapter that underscores the emotional chaos and the little one caught in the crossfire. You'll want to stick around for the bombshell about to drop. I met Chris, and all of a sudden I came pregnant, so I know I, Chris is the father. So wait, you're saying that you were only having sex with one other man other than Mr. Jordan? Just one time in April, and then I found out I was pregnant in June. Okay, so was that potentially the window of conception? Yes, Your Honor, but I know that Chris is the father. But how, if you had sex with the other guy? He's the father. 
I just know that he's the father. As the emotional temperature hits a boiling point, Mr. Jordan pours his heart out about his bond with Caitlin, painting a picture of a man who dove headfirst into fatherhood, diaper changes and all, amidst the swirling doubts over who contributed the other half of her DNA. It's a saga of love, paternity puzzles, and a man's determination to be the best dad possible. The next twist is guaranteed to have you picking your job off the floor. That, like, when this little girl was born, like, that would change my life. Like, that, that would did it for me. That's what made me start going in a positive direction. This is what I don't understand. It was all going well. It was, you know what I'm saying? And, and so and how does it go wrong? This is where it goes wrong. Her and the family member get, gets into, like, an altercation or whatnot, like an argument. It wasn't even an altercation, it was an argument. And it was like, they, they started, like, throwing dirt on each other, you know what I mean? So she said something about this family member's in front, in front of this family member's boyfriend or whatever. Hold on to your hats because the drama meter's about to explode with a bombshell reveal. Snapshots of Mr. Sanavius Knight playing happy families with Caitlyn. The plot thickens as we're left to puzzle over the real daddy drama and Ms. Himes' tangled web of tales. Gear up as the mystery only unravels further from here. Over to somebody else. I'm like, I'm like, how am I the last person to find out? Do you out? know who this man is, Ms. Himes? <laughs> That's the guy I had sex one time with when I met, um, met Chris. That's the one that was having sex since 2010. So what was Caitlyn doing on his lap? My family Family members are messy, so when I drop her off on the weekend, I don't know what object. they do. Object. Wait a minute, Yana, when you drop. Y'all know I object. My thing is, what your family members gotta do with my daughter on another man's lap? Right, because that's first, what I wanna know. The courtroom gasps for air is in a move no one saw coming. Sanavius Knight strides in, oozing confidence, and drops the bomb that he's been led to believe he's Caitlyn's real dad, courtesy of Ms. Heim's plot twists. This revelation sends the narrative spiraling into a vortex of lies, confusion, and a serious need for a family tree clarification. But hold your horses. This soap opera's got more episodes. It has been brought to this court's attention that there are pictures of you with Kate, where you put in a caption that this is me and my baby Kate, where you are referring to this little girl as your daughter. Yes. Do you believe Caitlyn is your daughter? Yes, that's my baby. She told me when she got pregnant, she's like, I'm pregnant. I'm like, what you telling me for? She's like, well, it's not Chris, because me and Chris been together a year and a half, and we ain't got pregnant. As the emotional dust starts to settle, or so we think, the spotlight shifts to the emotional wreckage left in the wake, Caitlin's confused heart and the carousel of potential dads. The judge lays into Ms. Heim with a verbal lashing for her script-worthy manipulation and deceit, pushing her towards a path of redemption for the little one's sake. Brace yourself. The finale is bound to be a tearjerker. That's irrelevant to what, 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 what the matter at hand. And we got one person manipulating two different guys on one child. Like, it's not, it's not bothering. It's not gonna hurt you. It's not gonna hurt you. You feel me? It's gonna hurt her. Dig what I'm saying? Like, at the end of the day, I don't want her life to be messed up off the, off the choices her mother made. You dig what I'm saying? Like, I love, I love that little girl. I, I, you know what I'm saying? If I could, you know what I'm saying? I would, but bye. You know what I'm saying? I'm not, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna take that from him. In a climactic revelation that feels like the season finale, the DNA results are unsealed. It has been determined by this court. The biological father is Mr. Jordan. Mr. Jordan, you are Caitlin's biological father. In the quirky aftermath of what seemed like just another ho-hum day in court, the plot twist hits you like a surprise birthday party gone wrong. Miss Chappelle, with the dramatic flair of a soap opera queen, spills the beans on her steamy affair and throws a curveball about the paternity of her five-month-old daughter. She doesn't just admit it. She practically sings it, turning the courtroom into a mix of a confessional booth and a reality TV show set, stirring up the pot right from the get-go. The courtroom, now a circus of stunned silence and dropped jaws, braces itself for what's next. Day, day. Miss Chappelle, you're married Woman who admits to having an affair, and now you say you have questions regarding your five month old daughter's paternity. Yes, Your Honor. Standing next to you is your father, Mr. Wells, and he doesn't want you to get the results. Today. And just when you're munching on your popcorn, thinking this can't get any spicier, the story cannonballs into the deep end of the drama pool. Mr. Chappelle, looking every bit the jilted lover from a telenovela, shares his roller coaster of emotions upon hearing the pregnancy news, which quickly sours into a cocktail of betrayal and despair. His heartbreak scene is so vivid, you'd half expect a violin soundtrack to start playing in the background, highlighting the soap opera-worthy personal stakes at play. And then, as if by magic, another voice jumps into this melodramatic symphony, turning the plot into a veritable opera of the absurd. You say you were elated when your wife told you she was pregnant. Yes, Your Honor. And then that joy turned to pain when she revealed that you may not be her baby's biological father. Yes, Your Honor. You admit you'll be heartbroken if day test results prove your wife's lover is in fact the child's biological father. Yes, Your Honor. 
As the suspense thickens, we dive headfirst into the juicy saga of family honor, skeletons in closets, and secret handshakes. Enter Mr. Wells, Miss Chappelle's dad, who practically channels his inner godfather, fretting over the family's rep and the seismic shock the paternity results might unleash. He adds a delicious layer of old-school drama, making you wonder if you've accidentally stumbled into a family saga novel. The air crackles with tension as everyone leans in, popcorn in hand, waiting for the next bombshell. Well, ma'am, uh, I met her mother when she was pregnant about three months, and it just come to the point that, you know, we made an agreement one time just to walk away from it. And it's the point that the granddaughter, I don't want to see her go down that road. Some things are better left unsaid, ma'am. No offense, Your, Your Honor. Your Honor, it's, it's, up, it's about Lee and me. I need to find out if I'm the father or not. He has the right to know. I have the right to know. No, we can't go down the road. In the swirling vortex of emotional upheaval, a bomb drops that shakes the pillars of marital bliss to their very core. The plot meanders into the steamy reasons behind Miss Chappelle's extramarital escapade, shedding light on her yawn-inducing sex life. This confessional turns the affair from a simple scandal to into a tragic comedy of marital woe, making you wonder if they were ever happy. Strap in, folks, because this roller coaster of desperation and longing is about to go off the rails. So, please take me back. How did all of this begin? Well, we met at a high school football game and it was love at first sight. We got engaged four months later. We got married on Valentine's Day. We had a son together probably about a year later. I started getting bored with our sex life. I kept telling him and telling him and telling him. Hey, I said I wanted to people. change it. Four well, months if later. I tell you we needed to change it because I wasn't happy sexually. The plot thickens, revealing a master class in the art of sneaky liaisons and cloak and dagger romances. We get a sneak peek into Miss Chappell's secret agent level tactics for Rendez Vusing with her lover, making James Bond look like an amateur. This segment paints a picture of a woman who's not just in it for the thrills. She's practically crafting a second life, complete with a plot twist every episode. Just when you think you've unraveled the mystery, the story laughs and says, think again. He was a friend. We started sexting, and I would hide it. We would send messages on Facebook. We would meet up. We met in his driveway, the hotel. I mean, we had sex, and it was what I wanted sexually. He wasn't scared to go in there and jerk my clothes off and say, I want you like this. I want that in my sex life, and I should be able to experience that with my my husband, but we don't. You were sleeping with both men during the window of conception. I had sex with both of them on the same day at one point. Yeah. Diving into the heart of the storm, we follow a man as he tries to piece together the jigsaw of his life, now more puzzling than a Rubik's Cube. Mr. Chappelle's saga of confronting the other man adds a spicy twist, showcasing his turmoil and determination with the intensity of a climactic movie showdown. As we navigate through this emotional minefield, the story prepares us for an earth-shattering revelation that's about to redefine everything we thought we knew about family drama and love triangles. So all this time, you find out you're pregnant. When you get news she's pregnant, you're excited because you think you're going to be a Oh, yeah. I was browsing on the internet, uh, sitting at the computer, and she told me she was upset. I was kind of wondering why she was upset. We're supposed to be happy. It didn't make sense to me. The moment of truth crashes in a whirlwind of raw emotions and knotted narratives changing the game forever. The grand reveal of the DNA results sends shockwaves through the story. It has been determined by this court, Mr. Chappelle, you are not her biological father. Why'd you do this for? <laughs> I'm so sorry. Really <laughs> I'm still going to be there for her. We're diving headfirst into the roller coaster case of Whitaker versus Schroll, where the courtroom turns into a daytime drama stage. Ms. Whitaker is on a mission to prove Mr. Schroll is the father of her adorable yet evidently disputed two year old daughter, Brinley. According to Ms. Whitaker, Mr. Schroll's hesitation is all thanks to his mother's meddling ways, pushing him to evade his daddy duties. Buckle up for a wild ride filled with jaw dropping revelations. Classic case babies having babies. This is it. These are not the type of extracurricular activities you need to be engaging in when you're in school. I completely agree, but since then I've gotten my GED. I am very proud of you for getting your GED. Thank you. But I want to understand something, because you said Mr. Stroll's mother was getting in the way of your relationship. If you all were all living together, why do you say she doesn't like you and she was interfering in a relationship? The drama intensifies to soap Oprah levels. The spat between Ms. Whitaker and the formidable Mrs. Stroll senior Escalates into an all-out war with accusations flying faster than a soap opera slap. This heated exchange shines a spotlight on the dramatic effects of external family influences on a love story. Things are about to get even steamier. Mr. Schroll, did you know your mother didn't care for Ms. Whitaker? She cared for her. I don't know where that she didn't care for her comes from because anytime Miss Whitaker needed to talk to her, she'd come to my mom. She'd call her mama. Really? 
Really? Did you call his mother mama? Yes, because we were together for two and a half years. Our families were each other's families. Was this a committed relationship? We were together for three years, yes. Dive deeper into the melodrama here, reflecting on their vows and dreams derailed by whispers of infidelity. This segment feels like a plunge from romantic highs to the lows of mistrust and betrayal. This chapter vividly paints the picture of a love story turning sour, brimming with doubt and heartache. But wait, there's more heart-wrenching drama on the horizon. We were actually going to get married in May, the year that I found out I was pregnant and I had bought his ring and my ring and everything. And I can see that makes you sad to think about that. Yeah, because we were really happy at one point. And I thought it was going to be forever. Both it of was. you are acting like you were committed, but if you were committed and nobody did anything outside the relationship, you wouldn't be here. Yeah. So let's get to the real details. What had happened? We, Her um, mom had passed away. Okay. And she got put in a, a foster home. And once she okay. turned 18, she go, went with family. Grab your tissues for this one. Ms. Whitaker opens up about her personal tragedy, losing her mother, enduring the cold world of foster care, and the bombshell of her pregnancy. This segment tugs at every heartstring, showcasing her fight through adversity and the emotional turmoil of those dark times. Prepare yourself. The next revelation is a doozy. She had cheated on me. How did that come up? It took a little bit for it to come out, but eventually it did come out. She admitted it. Did you admit it, Ms. Whitaker? Yes, I did. First, Your Honor. <laughs> no, that's not how all of this happened. That's not how we separated. Okay, when let me hear your side of it. When my mother died, I got taken into DHR custody. I was only 17. I was eight months from being uh, 18. Anyway, they put me with my aunt, and me and Christian were fighting all the time. I was hormonal. I was pregnant. His mother refused to let him come to my doctor. The tension could cut glass. Enter Ms. Blackwell, Mr. Shrule's mother, with her take, casting a storm of doubt over the young couple's love and questioning Brinley's paternity. The clash between Ms. Whitaker and Ms. Blackwell couldn't be more palpable, but the drama doesn't stop there. It's about to go into overdrive. Well, she's How not here, so we cannot talk point. about her. If I cannot speak of. All right. When you found out she was pregnant, did you think the baby was your grandchild? I did because my son believed at No, you didn't. Time you told me was. from the beginning that's not his child. Not until she admitted to me. Edge of your seat suspense. The paternity puzzle gets more convoluted with twists of infidelity and the murky waters of Brinley's parentage. This segment delves deep into the tangled webs woven by past decisions and their shadows over the present. The climax is near and it's going to be epic. These days are outlined completely every day. Every day. From the second. I don't remember any of that. To the 31st, you had sex with Mr. Schroll. You you don't remember that? We lived together for three years. We had sex every single day. How do you okay. not remember that? How do we sleep together when you're either in a foster home or you're at a girl's home or you're living? I your wasn't in a foster room. home at the beginning of August. I wasn't in a foster home until August 30th. Your heart will be racing here. The post-birth saga unfolds with new characters and a bitter battle over the birth certificate, leaving Mr. Shrule in the dust. This chapter highlights the gritty reality of navigating co-parenting amidst a storm of contention and unresolved issues. But the ultimate twist is just moments away. This is a birth certificate, certificate of live birth. Uh, Brinley Ann Smith and father's name is Nicholas Dwayne Smith. I want to understand if you are certain Mr. Schroll is the father. On the day Brinley's born, he does show up to the hospital. Only because his mother I him. don't care how he got there. I don't I care if he was there. following the sun and the moon and the stars. He got there. And you say he's the father. Why put another man's name on your child's birth certificate well, if the man that you are so certain is the father is there? Your Honor, when I woke up from my C-section, he wasn't even there. I woke up the next morning, and on Facebook, Christian had posted stuff all over Facebook about my boyfriend, about my family, saying, baby mama drama already. I told him, I don't want you to come back. The grand finale we've all been waiting for. In a dramatic courtroom reveal, the DNA results are in. Mr. Schroll. You are her father. I am her father. <laughs> Thank you. I apologize for everything. I really do. I'm sorry I put you through this. I'm just so happy after two years. Finally, you finally know you can finally start being there. In an absolutely bonkers twist you'd swear was made up, we dive headfirst into the saga of Co vs. Co, where the grandmother is throwing some serious shade on her grandson's DNA because of her daughter's, let's call it, free-spirited love life. And as if that's not spicy enough, she's also campaigning for her daughter to win a free pass to parenting boot camp. Buckle up, folks. This roller coaster is just leaving the station. Today we have the case of Co v. Co, mother versus daughter. Uh, Miss Co, you say you're here today because your daughter is an out-of-control teenager and she needs help. 
Furthermore, you claim that uh, you have serious doubts that your daughter's boyfriend, Mr. Boyce, is father of your seven-month-old grandson. You say Mr. Boyce has been a good father to the baby, but that your daughter has numerous sexual partners. Now, just when you thought we'd hit peak drama, the mom lays out her daughter's rap sheet of teenage rebellion. We're talking brawls in the schoolyard and a scuffle with a cop. Yep, it seems respect for authority is on back order for this one. But wait, there's more? Fights at school, hitting a police officer, not once, but twice. She hitting a police him. officer. She punched her twice. I get the phone call to go up to the school. I get there. I was thankful that I knew this police officer. He looks at me and he says, this is your daughter? He says, I could take her to jail right now. She could have a felony. You think you've seen it all? Oh, please. We're about to dive into a saga of home-wrecking proportions, with our leading lady turning their humble abode into a demolition derby. Windows shattered, mom's car redecorated with the rebel without a cause look. And just when you think that's gotta be it, there's another twist waiting. Made a phone call saying I and my girlfriend had jumped on her because she still did not want to follow house rules. All I asked her to do was not disrespect the house. Don't bring the drama to the house. You brought drama to the house. That's not you the made truth. a phone call saying, my mother and her girlfriend just jumped on me. Y'all, you come mess them I up. I said her girlfriend just jumped on me, and I did have but somebody that wasn't come over The plot thickens like grandma's gravy at Thanksgiving as we unearth the roots of this family feud. Picture this, a childhood spent with dad because mom was offering the role of the mysterious absent character, which has left more than just a bit of bitterness and betrayal in the air. The drama, it's not just simmering, it's boiling over. Children grow with their mother, not their father. I grew up with my father because due to the fact she abandoned me when I was two I years old. I did not abandon you. I was told she dropped me off when I was two years old and never came back. Oh. And the reason I believed it is because I haven't seen her until I got in my teenage. You didn't have so much as a visitation. Oh yes, I had visitation rights, she came over on. I never and missed so a And so did you ever have a positive relationship? No, not really. Then, out of left field, we swivel the spotlight to the kiddo's daddy drama. In a heartfelt confession, both mom and daughter spill the beans on the daughter's eclectic taste in men, leaving us with a cliffhanger lineup of potential papas. But just when you're trying to keep up, they hit you with a plot twist you never saw coming. But it's because not just one guy. That's what she's saying. But it's not just one guy. There was somebody else in the picture. So, mom, you're saying she was sleeping with multiple guys. I know that there was someone else. Now, how many more it was, I'm not for sure. But I do know that there was someone else. And I find now she's pregnant. I go to the guy. I go to Larry. I say to Larry, look, as Zaire's mother, I'm gonna keep it real with you. As the emotional stakes skyrocket, enter Mr. Boyce, the boyfriend on the verge of a nervous breakdown, clinging to hope like a soap opera star to a script. He waxes poetic about fatherhood and personal growth amidst a sea of daddy doubts. And just when your heart's about to burst, the story takes a leap into the unknown. Mr. Boyce, please come and step to the podium. We know that today we're here to determine the paternity of this particular child, but we also know that this child is very important to you. Am I correct? Yes. From the beginning, I knew it was a possibility, but at the same time, you know what I'm saying? He made, he made me grow more, you know what I'm saying, since he's been around. Brace for impact, because we're reaching a crescendo that'll knock your socks off. The paternity reveal party has a bouncer. When it comes to baby Christian, Mr. Boyce, you are not the father. You hear his father? Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, you are. I'm still. You okay? I know this was not the way probably any of you wanted this to turn out. All right, strap in for a wild ride, folks. Can you believe the tension here? Introduction and stakes. In the left corner, we have Ms. Loman, ready to rumble in court to prove her fiance, Mr. Mitchell, is indeed the biological father of her superstar daughter, London. The plot, their future matrimonial bliss hangs by the threat of a DNA test. If Mr. Mitchell isn't the dad, well, the wedding's canceled, and it's going to be more awkward than a family reunion after a game of Monopoly. Mr. Mitchell, on the other hand, is riddled with doubts and backed by his cousin, who's pretty sure this is a plot twist from a daytime soap opera. Grab your popcorn, you're not going to want to miss what comes next. Ms. Lohman, you are in court today hoping and praying your fiancé, Mr. Mitchell, is the biological father of your daughter, London. And you and your mother are here to prove it. You say today's DNA results will determine the future of your together. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Mitchell, you say nothing would make you happier than finding out you are London's biological father. But you are in court today, believing there is no way you are. 
The saga thickens, and I'm not just talking about the plot, background of the relationship. Ms. Loman gives us the lowdown on their love story, starting from innocent high school friendships to it's complicated. She spills the tea on how they went from passing notes to passing the remote, especially after Mr. Mitchell moved in to dodge the drama at his own home. And just when you think it's going to be a smooth ride into sunset and happy endings, the story veers off into another soap opera episode. When me and Jonathan got together, I was, you know, I was very happy. We got engaged January of last year, and if London is not to become Mr. Mitchell, then our wedding is going to be off, and that's going to, you know, it's really going to upset me. All right, and how is it affecting your relationship now? Me and Mr. Mitchell, we fight all the time about, you know, me telling Mr. Mitchell that London is his, and turn up the heat because things are getting spicy. The relationship turns romantic. Picture this, Mr. Mitchell and Ms. Loman living under one roof, sparks flying amidst family dinners and laundry days, despite Ms. Loman juggling another bow on the side. It's like a rom-com, but with more complications and less Hugh Grant charm. The next twist, it's just around the corner and it's juicier than you think. Were you single at that time? No, Your Honor, I had a boyfriend at the time. Moves in, and then what happened? Um, after about two months of him living with me and my family, we were sitting on the couch one day just talking and he kissed me. And and I told him, you know, I have a boyfriend, we can't do this. And he just kind of shrugged it off and said, okay. So at that point, Mr. Mitchell was just your friend? Yes, Your Honor. About a week after that, we were in the pool and we were swimming under the water and he kissed me under the water and I came up and I didn't, I didn't stop it. The paternity doubt. In a plot twist worthy of a telenovela, Ms. Loman reveals there's another potential daddy in the mix right around the time Little London decided to make her grand entrance. With no protection in play, the plot doesn't just thicken, it practically solidifies. But wait, there's more drama on the horizon and it's about to get as tangled as headphones in your pocket. So tell me about what you came to love about Miss Loman. I loved how she did stuff. I liked how she cared for me whenever didn't have anybody that cared for me. And she said you had a very tough childhood. Is that true, honey? Yes, ma'am. I was abused. I was had to do everything for my family. I raised my three sisters and my brother basically by myself. Seriously, did anyone see this plot twist coming? Physical resemblance and doubts. Ms. Loman plays detective, pointing out all the ways London is basically a mini Mr. Mitchell from her eye color to her eyelashes. But then she throws in a curveball about timing with her ex, making this paternity puzzle more confusing than a Rubik's Cube. Buckle up, this roller coaster of emotions has a few more loops to go. Everything pointed to Mr. Mitchell. Yes, Your Honor. How do you tell? We were sitting at home and I told him, I was like, there is a possibility that London could be yours and because I looked at the dates and then after she was born I was like Mr. Mitchell she looks just like you I was like she has your eyes the same exact eye color but just because she, she has blue eyes and blonde hair doesn't mean she's fine yes had to but my ex had light blue eyes Jonathan has dark blue eyes London has dark blue eyes and so all through this pregnancy who's helping you Mr. Mitchell is Talk about an emotional whirlwind, bonding with London. Despite the swirling vortex of paternity doubts, Mr. Mitchell steps up like a champ, forming an unbreakable bond with London. It's like watching a feel-good movie, where you're rooting for the underdog, tissues in hand, for happy and sad tears alike. But keep those tissues handy. The drama's about to dial up to 11. Yes, Your Honor. How so? Explain to the court. I love her to death. Oh. She's amazing. She's amazing, you said. Yes, Your Honor. He has been there from day one. He takes care of her. He watches her. He he has he he has become so attached to this baby. But the the doubts are there, and it is better for him to know now. It's better for everybody, especially London, to know now if he is in fact for certain her father. Twist turns and a side of manipulation, concerns of manipulation. Enter Mr. Mitchell's cousin, the voice of reason, or perhaps the chorus in this Greek tragedy, hinting that Ms. Loman might be playing 4D chess with everyone's hearts. It's a moment that adds a sprinkle of suspicion to this already spicy story stew. And just when you think you've seen it all, the next revelation is about to leave you absolutely gobsmacked. He's being taken advantage of. I believe that she knows that Jonathan is going to do what is right. He loves the baby and he is going to step up and be the father that she needs. And I feel like because she knows that, that that is why we are in the situation. Ms. Loman has chosen Mr. Mitchell yes. as the best of the two options. Right. And for the grand finale, the moment we've all been waiting for, DNA results and reactions. It has been determined by this court. Mr. Mitchell, you are not the father. <laughs> Miss Jackson, in all her fury and fabulousness, storms up to her husband's so-called mistress, Miss Lipscomb, armed with nothing but pure sass and a mission to debunk the outrageous claim that the one-month-old fashionista, Baby Courasia, shares DNA with her husband. Miss Jackson is all, if this baby is his, I'm out of here faster than you can say divorce. The audience loses their minds. Trust me, you'll be glued to your screen for what's coming up. Here to confront your husband's mistress and to prove her one-month-old daughter, Asia is not his biological.
biological yes, daughter. Your Honor. You learned today that the child is in fact your husband's. Your marriage is over. That's right, Your Honor. You'll be picking your jaw up off the floor. Just outside the courtroom drama, Mr. Jackson is sweating bullets, probably wishing he was on another planet. Miss Jackson spills the tea on catching her hubby red-handed and confronting the duo of deceit, Mr. Jackson and Miss Lipscomb. When Miss Lipscomb tries to claim her title as the girlfriend, Miss Jackson drops the wife bomb on her, leading to a dramatic reveal of pregnancy by Mr. Jackson. Grab your popcorn. The drama is just getting started. How did you find out your husband may be having a child with what? his mistress? I got an epiphany. Call it woman's intuition, whatever you want. Well, I went to my husband's job. It was about 9.30 or 10.30 at night, and he, he approached the car. We talked for a few minutes, and to end our conversation, I told him, I feel as though... This roller coaster has more twists than your grandma's spaghetti. Cue the dramatic music as they delve into the saga of BM, baby mama versus wife. It's a wild ride through lies, deceit, and a lack of commitment from Mr. Jackson, who seems to have trouble understanding the concept of honesty and fidelity. Miss Jackson and Miss Lipscomb throw shade like it's sunny in the courtroom, turning the tension up to 11. Brace yourself. It's about to get even crazier. Your Honor, he was he labeled as BM, to know. my baby mother. And he didn't have a ring on. He had the ring, but the ring was never that saying that this is my wife. Why this am I walking around with a ring marriage. on? Previous Thank marriage you. on the ring Come finger? And all and get I mean, this, this, to each his own. Honor, but AKA, she trifling. At, and that's what that, trifling at that, at that point, I feel like if this is your husband and this is so you say, y'all working on your family, you trying to get it together, why is your husband in the room and not at home with you and your kids? You're not ready for this bombshell. Just when you thought it couldn't get more tangled, Miss Jackson pulls a detective move and presents evidence that Miss Lipscomb might have been playing the field too, throwing the paternity of little Kiasia into a whirlwind of doubt. The courtroom turns into a datum drama fest as they sift through the potential daddy drama. Your guess is as good as mine on who the father could be. The next piece of evidence will have you screaming at your screen. Did the affair end? And he went to jail? Yes, ma'am. So you have not been intimate with him since? Yes, ma'am, I have. I'm not even gonna lie. Mr. Jackson, what happened when you found out your mistress was pregnant? I found out when I was in jail, cause I guess the beginning of the year, her birthday time, she got sick and went to the hospital. Strap in for a wild ride. In a twist, no one saw coming. Mr. Jackson admits he signed the birth certificate, throwing everyone for a loop. Despite this, he's been about as supportive as a chocolate teapot, not providing a dime for Kiasia. The debate heats up between Miss Lipscomb and Miss Jackson over motives and morality in the messiest custody battle ever. You'll need to see it to believe it. And did you sign the birth certificate? Yes. You did. So if it's Your not Honor, his child, Your why Honor, would he sign the birth certificate? Exactly even more to speak on so her Mr. behalf. Mr. Jackson, you've acknowledged paternity. Yeah. Your Honor, that's why the baby was placed on my benefit. This is my what military. she keeps saying, that the baby's placed on her benefits, Your but Honor, I her also baby... Your Honor, I benefits, Your Honor. I also have proof of that, Your Honor. Let me see that paper. He automatically claimed all legal and financial responsibilities to that child. Just when you think you've seen every twist and turn, hold your breath for the paternity test reveal. When it comes to one-month-old Kiasia Jackson, Mr. Jackson, you are not the father. <laughs> Deal over, Your Honor. Now it's not even her husband's child. After all of this, do you know who her father is? Yes, Your Honor. Is he gonna wanna be a part of her life? No, probably not. Hold on to your seats, folks, because what you're about to hear is straight out of a daytime drama. But real life, Miss Hooker, with her mom in tow like a dynamic duo, steps into the spotlight with a bombshell. Mr. Abraham, the late son of the defendant, Ms. Baker, is claimed to be the daddy of Miss Hooker's adorable 10-month-old, Kenia. They're not just here for the drama. They want recognition and a big ol' we're sorry for the public snub from Ms. Baker's fam. Buckle up, it's going to get wild. Miss Hooker, you are here with your mother because you say the defendant's son, Mr. Abraham, fathered your 10-month-old month old daughter Kanaya. You say that Miss Baker and her family public denial of this child has caused you pain and you are here for an apology and to prove her son is the father. Is that correct? Yes, sure. In what can only be described as a plot twist you never saw coming, Ms. Baker stands her ground, waving the flag for her dearly departed son, challenging the claim that he's the father of Miss Hooker's baby. She's throwing everything but the kitchen sink into proving her son had his doubts, turning this paternity puzzle into a full-blown saga. The air's getting thick with drama, and we're here for it. Mr. Abraham, because tragically, he was killed three months after the birth of this child. You say that before his death, your son expressed great doubt that he was the father of Miss Hooker's baby, and you are here to put the lies to rest. Is that yeah, correct? Yes. How have you been affected by Ms. Baker's doubts about Kanaya's paternity? 
just when you thought this couldn't get any juicier, Miss Hooker spills the tea on her and Mr. Abraham's love story turned roller coaster ride. From being BFFs to lovers, then kind of sort of co parents without the labels, it's a tale that tugs at the heartstrings. Miss Hooker swears he was her one and only, but folks, the plot is about to thicken with a capital T. I don't okay, care. okay. okay. so, so Miss Hooker, let me ask you, what was your relationship with Keyshawn? Were you boyfriend and girlfriend? First, we was best friends. Sixth grade year, we was best friends. And then we, we started talking, then we stopped talking, and just like, like we stopped talking, then we started going together for a minute. And then like, we just, when I got pregnant, we was just like, we all we always talk, but we just stopped, going, but we still talking though, but we just stopped going together. Like we weren't boyfriend or girlfriend. But then you still talked. Yeah. Were you in love or was yeah. this, this was your first love? Yeah. The saga dives deeper into the heartache, revealing how this paternity face-off is tearing Miss Hooker and her crew apart. It's more than just drama. It's a full-on emotional earthquake, shaking foundations and leaving Miss Hooker to armor up against the world's chatter. The stage is set for more revelations, and trust me, you'll need tissues. It's her family who makes my daughter feel some type of way. It's not Miss Baker. She was too fat to be his baby. She fat like them, and it, it's just a whole bunch of stuff. Never from Miss Baker, it's always her family who always have something to say about about my daughter feelings have been hurt. It's always talk about her like she just tramp and I'm like enough. Here comes a heart wrencher. Ms. Baker takes us down a melancholy path, recounting the sad demise of her son, Mr. Abraham, against the backdrop of this paternity quandary. It's a moment that puts the whole drama into perspective, painting a portrait of grief and unresolved questions. The drama's not over though. There's more heart tugging ahead. I'm so very sorry. He just told me to promise him that we was going to get a test done because of what the other young man said. And you know, What did the other young man say? He told Keyshawn that when he wasn't around, he was supposedly sleeping with the night. Miss Hooker, I have to ask you, was there another guy? You know, that's why it's funny, because how can somebody tell me who I was sleeping with? Just when the audience thought they'd caught their breath, Miss Hooker comes back swinging against those cheating rumors. With her mom by her side, dropping truth bombs about Mr. Abraham's waffling paternity beliefs, it's a defense that adds more spice to this already sizzling story. And guess what? The drama escalates from here. When him and my daughter was arguing, other than that, I had pictures with him laying on her stomach. He had doubt only when he was angry. And I cannot get mad at what he tell his mother or nothing like that. But when he came over there with us, he held the baby, kissed the baby, and loved the baby. He just needs to get the results for Miss Carolyn. It doesn't matter. It's all about her. And he did ask her to get the blood test. For it won't be no doubts on their end about my grandbaby because it's, it's sad now. Hold the phone because the drama meter just broke. Kanaya's absence from her supposed dad's obituary throws gasoline on the already blazing fire between the families. Miss Hooker's feeling more sidelined than ever, but folks, brace yourselves. The juiciest twist is yet to unfold. My mama has a relationship with them. I don't. It may or may not be his. I did not put the baby name in there. That, my mom has to read that obituary. She lost a child. Nobody else lost one. If this baby turned out to be his, that's a that's a death all over again. Do I want my mama to look in there and look at a reminder of a baby that was supposed to be his? No, I do not. Think about my mama feelings. It's a, it all has nothing to do with her. Just when you think you've seen it all, the DNA results drop with a major scandal. It has been determined by this court. The percentage of relatedness between Ms. Baker, Mr. Abraham, and Kenaya Abraham is 0%. This, this is why right here. Miss Baker, are you all right? Do you need no. to sit down? Do you need it's to sit not. down, ma'am? 